Welcome back. Just about every day, we're getting new indications of the massive financial damage happening due to COVID. Today, it's retail sales, which is the largest driver of our economy. Those sales, they plunged nearly 9% just last month. That, a record. And this month, it's expected to be even worse. Plus, 16 million Americans have filed for unemployment benefits over the past few weeks. Again, a record number. Stimulus money, it is starting to get into people's bank accounts this week, but it simply is not enough for tens of millions of Americans who are concerned they can't make ends meet. According to a study in the Wall Street Journal, those payments will not be enough to cover monthly mortgage and utility bills for more than half of the recipients. Plus, a quarter of renters won't receive enough money to even cover their monthly payments. Plus, there is controversy surrounding the hard copy checks that people will receive if they don't have direct deposit. President Trump insisted that his signature appear in the memo line of those checks. If you're wondering, it's never happened before because those payments are supposed to be apolitical. Plus, that signature, it could delay their arrival by a couple days. Many people already concerned they're not going to get out here those checks till next month. Some people will not get the checks for up to three months. In addition, many Democrats are saying the stimulus program does not have the proper oversight and they're concerned about who will get paydays courtesy of Uncle Sam. Washington Post columnist Dana Milbank, he wrote a piece about a portion of the program that will benefit people who need help the least. Quote, it has become clear that one of the largest provisions, a $170 billion tax giveaway, appears to be tailor-made for the benefit of wealthy real estate investors such as President Trump and his son-in-law, Jared Kushner. The giveaway, primarily to real estate investors and hedge funds, is larger than the total amount in the legislation for hospitals and for relief of all state and local governments. I want to bring in our guest to discuss, former New York Congressman Joe Crowley. He was also chairman of the Democratic Caucus. So how's uh, quarantine going for you, Congressman? Well, so far, so good. I have my quarantine growth, <laughs> as you can see, as well. Um, I, I, it's, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's what we have to do. And, uh, and so um, I, like uh, others uh, facing this, the same crisis, are, we're doing our part, and that's... Uh, that's all you can do right now. You know, um, I'm going to take you back to Washington, uh, not because I don't like it, but uh, to get your perspective of what it's like um, behind closed doors, but also perspective of what it's like looking from the outside in. Um, there's been a, a range of emotions, but I think for the first time, at least in Trump's tenure, we've seen a test of government and the capacity of government to deal with a crisis. And I think by almost any standard, they haven't measured up. And I'm curious, are you more angry about the wasted time that we could have done more to be better prepared for where we are today? Or are you more worried about what happens in a few weeks when the president decides uh, that the country has to open up the doors to their homes and go outside and what we are or not prepared for, both from a health perspective, but also in terms of resuming this economy? Well, I think it's a combination of both, Richard. I think what I found extremely interesting was the president saying that he takes no responsibility for what really uh, was the causation here. And, and and this is not to cast blame, per se, but it's more about, you know, you were in office for three and a half years to continue to blame prior administrations when you're in office for three and a half years and still says, well, th well, they weren't prepared, and that's why we're not prepared today. When you know, when you look at that, and then at the same time, uh, the president is saying uh, that all the power I is invested in him; that the governors really have no say in this, which is somewhat preposterous. You know, we're a democracy uh, based on states' rights as much as we are on the federal government, and so um, you know, we're looking to governors like Cuomo, uh, Lamont. Uh, and, and Murphy and others in our tri-state region, but certainly beyond that as well, to help us through this. Each state is different. Each state, you know, you look at New York, uh, where, uh, you know, a number one majority, of, or at least a plurality, of the cases of COVID-19 are taking place in comparison to the state. So we are different. And uh, I think that Governor Cuomo was right in asking for us to be treated somewhat differently because of that as well. I don't know if you read it the same way. Um... Cuomo has taken um, an approach of two sides where he'll call out the president 
or some of the president's words when he thinks they cross a line. But at the same end, for example, today, he decided, did Cuomo, that he wasn't going to hold anyone accountable for the fiasco that is the absence of testing when we all know, um, you know, the buck stops with the White House. It seems really clear to me, Congressman, that if you're a governor, you got to walk a thin line here. If you cross the president and call him out, even on fact, you could worry about being extorted, and you're not going to get your ventilators, your PPEs, you're not going to get your state aid here. I mean, just think how crazy that is, that you could be blackmailed for your citizens if you have the temerity to call out a governmental response. I think, I think Cuomo has been very tactful in how he's been doing this, you know, just... Uh, in reference to him as being the king, and at the same time, uh, going back yesterday, uh, at the same time saying, I, I don't want to pick a fight. I'm not here to start a fight with the president. You know, so the, I think he's been very tactful, and I think for just that very reason, I think Gavin Newsom is, again, another example of someone who has been trying to work, certainly with the vice president uh, and uh, his committee, in terms of getting that federal funding that they need uh, in California. But you see that I think most governors are taking that tact as well. So I don't blame Andrew Cohen for this. I, I think that the, in any way, shape, or form, he's, he's dealing with a, a an incredible uh, uh, scourge here on our state. And uh, he's doing everything he can to provide the resources from the state, but also uh, expecting that help from the federal government to do it. He has to walk a fine line to some degree. You mentioned it, but I want to remind our audience what the president said um, just this week about where he believes his power starts and stops. Well, I'm going to put it very simply. The President of the United States has the authority to do what the President has the authority to do, which is very powerful. The President of the United States calls the shots. When somebody's the President of the United States, the authority is total. And that's the way it's got to be. Total. The authority is total. It's total. It's total. And again, I know the folks, we get bombarded with this, but this was in reference to the question, the president wants to open the doors on May 1. You could and will have states that aren't even at the apex um, of dealing with this pandemic in their states, and even states like New York, which will hopefully be on the right side of the curve, we're still having, you know, jam-packed ICUs, et cetera. My point is, Congressman, a second ago you said how preposterous it was, but can you imagine... If Obama said that, I jokingly said you'd have to have ambulances roll up to Capitol Hill to carry out some of your former Republican colleagues, and I bet you more than a few Democrats. I mean, it is crazy what he's saying, but we get to the point where your former colleagues, they write a check for $2.2 trillion, which is just one payment of many, and then he fires the inspector general and puts in one of his own guys. Why should we have comfort that he knows where the line starts and stops and that our money won't be misappropriated like we already are getting legitimate reasons that it will. Oh, I don't think you should have any comfort at all uh, in terms of any decisions or the statements that the president's making. And I think to some degree, you know, you and I are kind of chuckling here a little bit, um, but this is what we've known to expect from the president. And uh, he doesn't know what he's speaking about. He doesn't, he doesn't know what the Constitution says. He doesn't understand the Constitution. He's never been a student of it. He believes in his mind that all the power of the president is uh, omnipotent, that it's 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 omnipotent. It's everywhere, that he he can be, you know, he, he's in charge of New York as much as he's in charge of California, not understanding the federal system that was created by the Constitution that gives incredible powers, and rightfully so, to the governors of each state as well. You know, there are different laws in different states. I don't know if he knows that, but there are different laws in different states, different penalties for violating criminal laws, all those kinds of things. There's, there's not one uniform code of law for each state beyond the federal code of law, but which is for federal crimes and credit federal statute. But the president does not have um, omnipotent power. He is not omnipotent. He has, he has great power. He has the power to influence politically as well. And that's not to be understated. But I think you know, when the president makes those kind of statements, he makes us all uneasy. But we've, we've become almost numb to that, I think, unfortunately. Up next, Joe Crowley is going to stick around. We're going to discuss the presidential election and how COVID is upending.